Welcome to Charity Village Connects. We're pleased to welcome Mark Bloomberg as our guest today. Mark is a partner at the law firm Bloomberg Siegel LLP in Toronto and works almost exclusively advising nonprofits and registered charities on their work in Canada and abroad. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mary, for having me. I wanted to start by you know, really starting at the basics and getting your overview, your thoughts on the use of alternative forms of revenue for nonprofits and charities, such as social enterprise, social finance, impact investing, and other kinds of revenue generating tools or instruments from a legal perspective. Do you have any concerns or, or what are your observations from the work that you do? Well, I mean, uh, I guess I would start with that um, many charities are doing things that could be considered social enterprise, etc. Um, in fact, uh, more money is brought in from earned revenue than is from fundraising. So um, some people make it out like this is something that is a new thing in the last few years or something, but it's been happening for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. So it's not really new. Um, essentially, anything can be done. It's just a question of which vehicle can do it. And so if you're a charity, you get lots of advantages of being a charity, but there are also some restrictions. And so uh, just about anything can be done, but it might not be the charity can do it, but it might be a wholly owned subsidiary, or it might be a nonprofit. It might be an affiliated entity in some sort of some sort. So lots can be done. The question sometimes is that just like getting charitable status, people think is, you know, oh, if I get that, I'm going to all of a sudden be bringing in millions of dollars. You know, they have this fervent idea that this is, you know, going to be easy and, and all that. It's not so much. In fact, what we've seen is that charities, for example, in the UK that rely heavily on social enterprise during COVID were hit the hardest. So, you know, they say nine out of 10 small businesses fail. Um, charities have some advantages over entrepreneurs, but they also have some disadvantages. And many social enterprises and other types of interesting and innovative uh, things actually uh, fail. Um, some charities aren't even aware they failed uh, because they're, they're not fully keeping, in, uh, keeping uh, shall we say, tabs on the full cost and, and all that of the, uh, the, the effort. So um, it's definitely something good if you're trying to diversify your revenue, but there are huge risks associated with it. And when also before, especially if it's a big social enterprise, really make sure from a legal point of view that it's okay. Because it's one thing to try something out that's small and doesn't cost much and you, you, you give it up, you know, what do they say, fail fast or something. If you're going to fail, then have it be fast and, and not expensive. But if you invest a lot in something and then you do your research as to what a charity can do and you realize you can't do it, then this is less than ideal. But lots of things that can be done. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, the charity sector takes in almost $300 billion a year. Um, you know, and so I think that uh, government money is about, you know, it's, it's uh, about 60% of that. It's a lot of money from government. There's money from fundraising. There's money from business activities. I'm not thinking that this is going to be a replacement for some of the other major funding sources, um, but it could be very helpful. And it's not just about bringing in money. Often uh, some of these social enterprises and other things could be about also helping people and maybe meeting a need in a community or something like that. So you mentioned the risks. Uh, what are those risks? Maybe you could explain or give an example of what the risks might be for an organization that perhaps hadn't explored this and is thinking about doing it. The biggest risk when you're doing a social enterprise is the same risk when you're just running a business in the normal course, which is that you might put a lot of effort, a lot of capital into it, and you fail. That's the biggest risk, I would say. The next thing is, if you're running it through a charity, and as I said before, you don't need to run it through a charity. Sometimes it can be run through a for-profit that's owned by the charity. Um, but you get into charity regulatory things. There are rules around what sort of social enterprises, and even the word social enterprise is not a charity law word. So, you know, what are you actually doing, and is it a related business or not? Um, if it got really big, it might be that it isn't any longer a related business or if it's not related to your objects. So you need to look at your objects and work out what they are. In some cases, you may need to expand your objects uh, to be able to do the, uh, the social enterprise that you want to do. Um, so the, the main risks I would see is the risk of it not achieving what you want, either in terms of resources or other uh, benefits that you, you see. Um, and then the secondary risk would be the legal compliance type risks that one can have. 
Um, but, you know, also being a charity is very competitive, right? Lots of charities, especially in some areas. But uh, being a business in some areas can also be very uh, competitive as well. So I, I just think that one has to have a balanced view, uh, tremendous risk, uh, but it can be very good for a charity to have a social enterprise. So how easy or complicated does the current legal framework make it for organizations who want to engage in these kinds of activities? Um, you know, it's it, uh, you've obviously indicated that it's not something that organizations should jump into without some preparation, but what are the sort of frameworks in place currently that uh, allow for uh, a charitable organization, for example, to, um, to, to, be part of a or start a social enterprise, for example. Right. So the first thing is, um, I suggest that the word social enterprise, for example, not be used. Okay, that would be my first thing, because I think it's confusing. You need to just break apart what exactly do you want to do? Because many things that people call a social enterprise, it's actually a charitable activity. It's not even a business activity. It's a charitable activity where you're charging. Um, so that's the first thing is to actually work out what is it you want to do and take out all the lingo that isn't helpful in a way to trying to ascertain what you're trying to do. Right. And then the second thing would be, there are rules related business rules. It isn't helpful that the guidance hasn't been updated in almost 20 years by CRA, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and there's a lot you can do in there. As I said, more money is raised through earned income than through fundraising. So I think people don't realize the huge amounts of money that are potentially out there, you know, in certain ways uh, where groups are charging for uh, business activities and, and things like that. So the, the it's very doable. But as I said, charities being like a special purpose vehicle where huge incentives are given far more than in you know typical countries um you know in canada they're given huge incentives it's never going to be that a charity will just be able to compete on a quote unquote even playing field um unless of course the government got rid of the non tax you know right now tax you don't pay taxes if you're a charity and you get to issue official donation receipts um unless that is gotten rid of it'll never be a playing field that's fair for businesses and and so basically there's always going to be special rules for charities but you can get around that in a sense by just not having the charity do the social enterprise, have a separate entity. But the key thing to avoid the issues of the WE uh, charity scandal um, is basically, I would say, have it be 100% owned by the charity. So if the thing is very successful, it's the charity that gets the benefit of it, the equity and all that other stuff. Okay. Um, but you can do, like I said, almost anything. It's only a question of can it be done in a charity? Does it need to be done in a for-profit? Can it be done in a non-profit? Um, you know, it depends on the nature of the activity and whether you think it's going to be profitable, uh, because some things that are social enterprise, if you can even break even, that is tremendous. And you could be doing wonderful work, and then it could even be run as a nonprofit. It doesn't have to be a for-profit or anything of the sort, right? So I think what I would say is there are some lawyers and consultants who deal with these types of issues. And, uh, you know, people should just really think carefully about it, especially if it involves a large investment of money. I'd like to get your um, your impressions, your thoughts around what is being called impact investing. And this is something new. This concept is new to me because, of course, I think of uh, investing um, in for-profit corporations is obviously you're looking for a financial return. And it, mm -hmm. this term impact investing is still sort of opaque to me. Um, can you explain what you understand it to be and, and just how it can be utilized uh, by charities or nonprofits as a, a potential <clears throat> diversification of their revenues? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you have money to invest, um, you know, there's, you know, if you go back 40 years ago, it might have been thinking of what's the maximum return and that's all we cared about, okay? Then you had movements to, well, but we don't want to invest in arms or we don't want to invest in this or that, you know, some sort of negative screen. And then you move to a more positive thing and, and all that. Impact investing, I mean, I think uh, the concept's been around for a long time, but the terminology seems to every two to four years change. Uh, and uh, to be frank, I'm a little bit cynical sometimes. Because, um, you know, I look at some people who say, oh, yeah, we're impact investing. And uh, it's not really that different than normal investing. Um, and um, it, it's such a broad term that it doesn't really mean that much in my mind. Um, but if it means that you want to really align your values with the investing you do, then I'm all for that. I think that's great. Um, 
that the the terminology itself I find to be um, you know not always uh, reflective of the reality. And uh, so yeah, um, I think that um, I would say that at a minimum you need to do some sort of screening of what you're investing in. Uh, but whether it's going to be fully aligned or not uh, is is a different question. And charities, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is there's investing uh, where there's all sorts of rules, uh, federal rules and provincial rules around how a charity can invest. But there are also something called program-related investments, which are not really investments. They have different rules, and they're more like giving money to a group where you have some direction and control, and there's some tight requirements, but you don't have the normal return expectations, okay? And so that is another thing, and it's almost like a different category. And even though it has the word investing in it, it's not really investing. So one has to really work through the, shall we say, the legal concepts that would apply to a charity. Um, but a lot of what is talked about in terms of impact investing is very doable uh, in the charity sector. Um, but there are limits, like you're supposed to have a diversified uh, portfolio. So you can't just take 10 million, say you have 10 million to invest, you can't just take 10 million and put it into one company because you care about the environment and green energy and all that other stuff. Okay, so there's limits on what a charity can do. But otherwise, impact investing is something that uh, I think people are talking a lot about. Yes, I, I've heard a lot about it recently, and 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 I, I appreciate your comments because I'm I'm still not clear on what that actually means, and I think what you're saying is it can mean a lot of different things, and that's the problem with the term that it's so general and uh, uh, and it's used in a way that su may suggest something that's not actually true in terms of where the funds are actually being um, utilized or invested in. Um, am I? understanding you correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a, it's a newish term, I think, that uh, is being used. And I think the general approach makes sense. And it's something that charities should be aware of. Um, however, I'm just, um, you know, it's one of these things where uh, if you have 100 investment advisors, and they're talking about this, uh, there might be 50 different ideas as to what it means. It certainly isn't completely clear uh, as to what it is. Um, but that, that's just my impression of it, um, and different people are using it. So I would say that, um, yes, the idea sounds good. Um, what is actually happening? Um, right now, we have about $120 billion or something sitting in private and public foundations uh, being invested. Um, now, if you ask me, that's a bit of a travesty that so much money is sitting on the sidelines, basically, that when we have you know COVID and all these other problems. But certainly, there's no question that even if it's not 120, there's going to be some large amount of money the charity is going to have to invest because they need to have reserves and things like that, especially operating charities. And I would prefer that they invested in appropriate things, not just from a legal point of view, but also from an ethical point of view. So hopefully, yes, people will think about impact investing and how does it align with their objects and what they're trying to accomplish. So I'm all for that. Um, it's just like, you know, sometimes corporate social responsibility can be more like greenwashing or whitewashing or whatever it is. Um, so impact investing is a nice talk. Many foundations that have a lot of money should be talking less about how they invest it and more about how do we get money out the door to charities that actually need it, uh, especially at times like COVID. So uh, it's a balanced conversation. I think you have to think of both things. Okay. Well, speaking of COVID, the pandemic certainly seemed to highlight some of the challenges that charities face um, and nonprofits with regards to building infrastructure or to embrace digitization that was needed when everyone pivoted and had to work remotely or provide their services remotely. And that was because of limitations on how their revenues can be used. What are your thoughts about these laws? And do you believe that nonprofit and charitable sector really needs new flexibility uh, in the regulatory legislation to allow it to embrace new tools and revenue generating instruments? Or, you know, this certainly seems to have highlighted a problem in the sector. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I guess it might, it might be a minority view that I have. So the first one is, I, I think charities did an excellent job of pivoting, as they say, the overused word um, during the uh, changes that took place. A lot of it had to do with, although charities don't have a lot of money sometimes when it comes to things like administration and, and um, you know, management and, and IT and things like that, um, they managed to actually do a, a tremendous job of uh, changing how they operate, uh, delivering services differently and all that. I, I think I saw more changes in, in a matter of months than I saw in 20 years. So I think charities did a great job. Um, I think, um, you know, some lawyers maybe think 
uh, that the, the rules are a problem. I am not sure that the rules are a problem. Um, I have asked CRA to do a guidance on, as they have with fundraising, um, to do a guidance on administration. Because, in fact, for a little charity, the main administrative burden for some small charities are either corporate or CRA. So I would like CRA to say, and this is a document that the public can read, that it's important that charities have good books and records, good systems, internal controls, all this stuff. Um, and I want a guidance on that. I think that would be very helpful. Um, but the fact is, we know that charities are allowed to spend a reasonable amount on admin. And that could be for some really super simple charities, it could be a few percent. But for some very complicated universities or hospitals, it could be 20%, 25%, uh, you know. And, and we're talking, some of these groups have, you know, we're talking then hundreds of millions of dollars on admin. We're not talking small amounts of money. So with a $300 billion uh, total size of the charity sector, I know we sometimes think of it as a poor sector and every group is small, but a lot of groups are small, about a third are under, you know, 50,000. But there's a lot of uh, money also in the charity sector. So it's not all poverty there. Um, and basically, I think charities are allowed to spend reasonable amounts. I think a lot of the problem is donors um, and others who maybe um, don't understand the importance of administration and, you know, having, um, you know, capacity within your organization and having some duplication. So if one system fails, you've got another system. In other words, the cheapest path is cheap, but it's risky sometimes. Um, but I think this is, I, I don't see it as mainly a legislative issue or a, a legal issue. I, I think it's mainly an attitudinal issue that, um, I mean, for example, if I saw an international development charity spending, say, less than 5 or 10% on admin, I probably wouldn't donate to them unless I knew them very well and had lots of information on what they're doing because I just don't un understand how you can do it. OK, um, at least, uh, you know, CRA re recently revoked a charity that spent 200 million outside the country over four years. They had 4,000 projects and they had one part-time person taking care of everything. If that's how you want your money spent, then go to a low admin charity and uh, eventually it'll get revoked by CRA because it's not actually doing the stuff that it's supposed to do. That's a problem. Uh, so I think that uh, the problem is more attitudinal by the and, and people worrying in the charity sector um, that others will will criticize them because maybe they have some money spent on it. But um, I think that also comes down to making sure you've got a good board with people who understand the importance of having this uh, infrastructure within the organization. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that uh, it's necessary to um, to change the law. I have heard people, you know, the, I'll tell you what the problem is. If we say a charity can spend as much as it wants on administration, how are you going to feel when they spend 60% on administration and 35% on fundraising and they only spend 5% on charitable activities? You know, you're not going to be happy with that. But if we don't measure it, and we don't have some limits, and the limits are really, it should be what's reasonable, you know, as I say, reasonable, necessary, and proportionate. And when you're buying things, it shouldn't be more than fair market value. Unless we have some baseline rules, it will be the one in 10 or one in 100 who take advantage of it and basically say, oh, well, we can spend anything we want on it. So I think there has to be some limits, but it will vary tremendously depending on the nature of the organization and its activities. If you're dealing with vulnerable adults and children, you need to have all sorts of safeguarding and other procedures in place. Um, it's a good investment and ethically absolutely necessary. And that costs money. And that's, you know, uh, going to be something that might be uh, administrative a cost as opposed to necessarily a program cost. It depends on how it's, uh, what, what it, how it's uh, structured. Okay. That's uh, really fascinating because there is such pressure, I think, on a lot of charities to have that administrative uh, line item be, um, you know, lower uh, as a sort of almost a credibility factor uh, in terms of what their mission statement is and that they're fulfilling that uh, relative to just, you know, building up their own um, admin and, uh, you know, paying themselves. Um, so I, I, I do think that that's a, a really astute observation and, and one that obviously highlights uh, you know, an actual uh, must, it must be a challenge for a lot of leaders of charities to, um, to walk that um, tightrope in a way uh, in ensuring that they have sufficient um, admin uh, revenues uh, dedicated to admin, and at the same time, keep the number down low enough to have the credibility and the public trust. 
Yeah, and I would say, so having low admin actually, uh, like I said, I think can actually create problems for you uh, because people will be wondering what's going on. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not possible because you might just have some generous for-profit company who just pays for everything on the side. And we do see some foundations, you know, for example, giving away money um, who have no admin costs. How can they do it? Well, because someone pays for it. It's not magic, right? But um, if you're a self-sustaining organization and you're not covering off the things, because we know you can save money on admin by getting rid of financial controls and by, you know, just having less finance staff and uh, not getting accounting uh, help and not doing an audit and not, you know, there's lots of ways you can, by not being transparent, not worrying about uh, putting up stuff on a website, you know, you can be, you, so you can save some money, but then there's huge costs down the road. What I would say is a couple points. One is um, this relates also to the reserve fund. Um, every charity that is has ongoing costs needs to have a reserve. And many charities uh, were really tested uh, during COVID, and we're lucky that um, that people were generous and governments were generous and everything else. But many charities were not prepared for COVID in terms of um, they had almost no reserve fund. And as a result, if it wasn't for all this stuff that we can't rely on reliably to be there, they would have just gone under. Um, so having a reserve, so it, it's not only should we invest in admin and some of the things needed there, um, the finance and, uh, and, and all that stuff, but also to make sure at the same time that we have enough kept back because on the one hand, charities want to help their beneficiaries and spend everything on the beneficiaries that they can, right? They really want to move the money out the door, but they've got to hold back some so that they have one, two, three months or six months, depending on the organization, maybe even more, um, uh, basically reserve and, and that sort of thing. And the other thing I would just point out, which is a little surprise to me, but last year in the budget, they actually said that if you deliberately make, um, you, you put stuff on your T3010 and it's not correct, um, did your charity on that alone can be revoked. They don't need another reason. Okay, now charities are making often mistakes. Uh, we review hundreds of T3010s, 90% of them, there's mistakes on them. Uh, so there's lots of mistakes made. Um, that's not deliberate necessarily, but you can be suspended if it's not deliberate, which is, means you can't issue receipts for you. That's bad and it's public. But even worse now, if you're deliberately like making it look like your fundraising or admin is lower than it is, you, CRA on that alone can revoke you. So I would encourage groups to actually try to get the numbers to be as good as possible, right, correct, if you will, and also to to invest where necessary. Um, you do want to you want to be concerned with the long term survival of the organization. You also want to be thinking about your beneficiaries. Um, when an organization shuts down, sometimes that can result in a lot of beneficiaries suffering. So. It's it's not always in the best interest of the beneficiaries to have no reserve and not have proper administrative uh, processes and, and things like that. Okay. Well, I, I, again, this was a story that really fascinated me, and it certainly is uh, reflective of some of the issues that we've been talking about here today. You've written extensively about the We Charity scandal, and in fact, you testified to the Standing Committee back in December 2020. Can you tell us about what your first thoughts were when the story broke and, and how that evolved over the course of 2020 as, as the various sort of details kind of trickled out uh, and flooded out in some instances? Maybe you could just give us from your perspective on this. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, it's hard to remember back. It's a long time ago, right? But um, I think my initial thing was, I couldn't believe that the Liberal government did this. Like, it was so stupid what they did. I just, I couldn't believe it. There were so many problems with this and deciding to give so much money to one particular charity that there were lots of questions floating around about this charity was just monumental mistake. And and you have to understand, I, I, I try to stay away from partisan politics and stuff. I think the Liberals have done many great things. In fact, most of the things done during the whole COVID crisis are good. And I, I think that between SNC Lavalin and the We thing, these are probably two of the worst things, but maybe there are some other things, you know, uh, in terms of some things that they're not doing it or should be doing or whatever. But these are really, really bad things. So I just, I thought it was really bad. I was in shock basically for a few days. Just, I couldn't believe it. Like, this is crazy. I would say that in the beginning, there were a few people, maybe uh, five or 10 people within the charity sector, mainly BIPOC people, who actually were the ones who said something. Um, and that was fantastic that they were, they were prepared to jump up publicly, say something about this, uh, because honestly in Canada, if you want to criticize Stephen Harper or whatever, no problem, you know, 
you want to criticize uh, certain people, you know, within the charity sector, it's not a problem. But they're in whole areas where you have to be super careful, uh, or I shouldn't say have to be careful. Canadians are not prepared to say anything about it when it comes to issues like uh, granting and foundations and all this and government agencies that could give you a lot of money or not give you a lot of money. Um, we, we don't live in a free society when it comes to charities and that. It's very sad. So uh, those people who stood up at the beginning, really, that was courageous of them to do. Because now in hindsight, we know, oh, yeah, everyone had a problem with it, you know. But, and they canceled it very quickly because it was just such a tremendous mistake. But it, it raised bigger issues that I, I think are worse than the issues relating to charity regulation and all this. It relates to how can a government department, and, and some people are saying this should be the government department that represents the whole charity sector instead of CRA, how can a government department make such a bad mistake? That is something that I still don't know the answer to, how they, they could ever get there. I was thinking it was sort of like a corruption issue with, you know, Bill Morneau and all that, you know, and he's buddies with these guys, and then he resigns and all that. But I heard from other people in the charity sector that this is a lot more than a Bill Morneau issue. This is an issue of a government department having uh, not doing due diligence and having very strong ideas about what's right or wrong, but not doing basic, basic due diligence. And and I, you know, in fairness to government people, they don't run charities. They often don't understand how charities even work. Um, but, you know, you would think that they could develop the competency if it's important to them. And this government department that gives out so much money um, it's it's very that's very worrisome. Um, so that, if anything, was a big picture one of the biggest issues. And then the other thing I would just say is, you know, four hundred million dollars was donated to We over say twenty or twenty five years, whatever the case may be. It's a lot of money. And so it's not a question of does We do good. It's did they do four hundred million dollars worth of good? That's really I think more the issue. But even more than that, there are other issues. There's other groups that no one even knows about that are blowing two hundred million here and there and. And, and so I was thinking it's a good thing that the charity, the reporters are covering this part of the, the, this problem, if you will. But now I've gotten to the point where I'm like, there are so many other issues as well. So we had lots of problems, but there are other groups that there is almost no visibility to that, that have lots of problems. And we have very little transparency in the charity sector. So I uh, sort of want to move away from the we story. Um, I think that um, and I've written, as you said, um, you know, Mary, quite extensively on you know some of the lessons learned. And I also think a lot of groups learn the wrong lessons from a scandal. So I've seen people say, oh, you know what the lesson of we was, was you can't have more than one entity. You know, you can only have a charity and you shouldn't have a for profit. You shouldn't have this. No, uh, we had, you know, I think in the end, I don't know if it was 20 or 30 or 40 uh, different entities. The chair of we didn't even know about half the entities. Yeah, that's a problem. But, you know, if you're a, ch a charity and you want to do some sort of business activity that doesn't fit within the definition that CRA has of related business, then I would say set up a for-profit and you can do it. You know, if you want to have a non-profit that can do all sorts of things where, uh, you know, you don't have charity regulation. Now, you can't just take money from the charity and put it in the non-profit and then it's no longer charitable money. But a lot of money doesn't need to go into the charity. A government agency can give the money to the non-profit and a business can give it to the non-profit. And even if we could get a few percent of some organization's revenue going into those entities, it could be good. So I think people learn the wrong things from we sometimes, um, but there was a lot there to learn you know, about. Uh, one of the issues was treatment of employees, uh, and that's gotten a lot of attention, and that's good because I think that the charity sector, for all its talk about social justice and helping people, sometimes um, the people they take advantage of are volunteers and employees that are working in their own organization. So, um, you know, and uh, so it, it was amazing also to see, I've never seen anything like it, uh, so many journalists covering a charity and it lasting for so long. I thought this would be an issue that would be gone in a week. Um, but, um, you know, it was uh, interesting. And now we have a whole cadre of journalists who are quite knowledgeable about uh, charities, much more than they were before. And I think that it is resulting in and will result in more coverage of the charity sector and not the puff pieces about how wonderful the gala dinner was and which celebrities were there, but real questions around, um, you know, some organizations and how they operate and the lack of transparency and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's hard to remember back because that's so long ago, the beginning of that scandal. Um, and, you know, to the credit of the liberals, they did cancel the program really quickly. That's good. Um, but uh, how it ever could have gotten as far as it was is a monumental mistake. And uh, that's from someone who uh, approves of a lot of the things that liberals did during the, uh, the COVID uh, situation. So, Well, it's interesting. There was the political um, scandal, of course, and then the separate scandal, which was the actual when 
when one took a second look at how uh, the charity was being run vis-a-vis -vis its social um, enterprise uh, entities that were related to the charity and the money that flowed back and forth and, and, and then the transparency uh, and the governance issues around board uh, knowledge of uh, what was going on in terms of the financials. Isn't that the other the other big uh, scandal that emerged from this? Right. So I've sort of, I think, divided it into three. One is the political one, which, of course, uh, people in Ottawa are pretty fixated on. Uh, but, you know, there's the issue of we itself as an organization. And then also the particulars of the program the government wanted implemented, which is problematic in many cases. Um, you know, what is a volunteer? is a particular thing. You can't just call someone a volunteer and pay them $5,000 for something, okay? And so it just was very problematic. It was problematic from an employment law, minimum standards type perspective. It was problematic in that depending on the amount of money that we actually put out, um, this 543, what is it, $543 million program, um, if less money was given out, uh, in fact, we might have gotten paid as much as the money that was given out, you know, so if it was, you know, because not everyone was going to receive the 5,000, if everyone received the 1,000, we was going to make more money off this program than the program was actually giving out. And and so there was just the way it was constructed. And I'm not saying that was we that constructed it, because I think we had a different program they had suggested. This was uh, people within government saying this is what they want. And I think, uh, you know, there'll be other people writing about it and political scientists and whatever looking at it. And it, it calls into question uh, a major government department that does a lot of funding of the charity sector and whether it's, shall we say, as the British say, fit for purpose. And then even more importantly, when people are saying that this should be the center of the charity sector, that the charity sector maybe should be placed in you know, ESDC or in any particular government department, I start to get very worried, even though I thought that was a good idea a few years ago. I get worried because I think, what happens if there's a minister who doesn't really care or has a, a view that's antithetical to the charity sector, which could happen? And then you're you're stuck. You have to be in this one place. Right now, charities can contact any government department and you know talk to them and do what they need to do. But if you have one home in government, you might end up with a situation where they just simply every government department says, "Oh, well, please go to the home in government. Thank you." And uh, and that's a, a convenient excuse for people not to talk to charities. And then that home in government could be good or not good. So uh, th there's a lot of concerns with that. What seems like a little proposal, but when you look at how could they decide that all this money was going to be invested in the charity sector in one charity uh that's crazy um and then you know it's, it says something about the department um and you know the other thing was um the government continued to fund charities during COVID. that's good they didn't do cutbacks and stuff but there was very little special funding of the charity sector the uh you know united ways canadian red cross community foundations got some money but other than that really there wasn't that much and a lot of it i think comes down to the charity sector's leadership is very weak and also, um, I don't think uh, governments take the charity sector seriously. Um, so I think governments are very happy with the leadership of the charity sector. They like it. Um, you know, they don't deal with it like the you know Canadian Federation of Independent Business when they make suggestions. Uh, it gets a lot of uh, play. So they love the leadership that's weak, and they can just ignore it and just go on and do their own stuff. But the charity sector is happy to have a weak leadership. Uh, they seem to be okay with that. So then, you know, you don't get the extra funding and you don't get the other stuff. Look at the airlines. I mean, just airlines, how much money they get, you know, and all these other groups that are getting money and the charity sector sitting on the sidelines getting nothing, even though it's on the front lines of dealing with COVID and all that stuff. And now, obviously, some hospitals were getting money and all that. But I'm talking just the whole charity sector is on the front lines of a lot of the stuff and uh, not getting any real funding for it extra from the government. So I think there's some uh, lessons to be learned there that are beyond that and and also, you know, the, the conflicts that some organizations have, because some organizations that are umbrella organizations also are trying to get money for things. So, you know, one organization was actually involved with the, the WE Charity Program. Um, and so that created some complexity there as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the charity sector needs to sort of think in a strategic way about what type of representation does it want and how seriously does it want to be taken? And if we also put forward proposals that are, 
you know, not good proposals and things like that, then we can expect to be uh, not having any traction with the the governments. So, um, you know, this is a it's, a, it's a constant challenge. The reality is most people in the charity sector are not that interested in all the public policy issues relating to governance of the charity sector. So what it ends up is that a small group of people, maybe 50 or 100 or 200 that is really interested in that area, just, you know, uh, basically does what they want and uh, and then government just looks at it laughs and basically moves on and doesn't do anything about the issues or anything so uh, hopefully there'll be some improvements in the future on that uh, front well I, you know I, I think your comments around the home and government uh, kind of movement that is uh, I'm hearing about uh, is is really fascinating because you've identified something that is I think a vulnerability that hasn't often been addressed by those that are proponents of having a home and government is this is it is it wise to have all your eggs in one basket and um and you, you know having that power in one individual who may or may not be um you know a, a strong supporter of the nonprofit and charitable sector it, it's actually really so, something very interesting i hadn't actually put my mind to that yeah and as i said i was a supporter of the idea you know a few years back but I have seen what has happened in the UK and in Australia in terms of some of the stuff, and I have a lot of worries uh, because um, it's amazing how just changing one person at the top can, whether it's a charity commission, whether it's a, a, a some sort of um, a ministry, um, you, you change one person and all of a sudden uh, the whole tenor of the whole thing can change, the direction can change. And also anything done by government tends to have some real costs. I'm a big fan, by the way, of government getting involved. If you want to get a million people out of poverty, government is the best way to do it. But if you want to do certain tasks discreetly, sometimes government is not the best way to, to do it and coordinating things. It's just very expensive. Um, and so, um, you know, I could easily see it costing tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, in government, you don't bat an eye at things like that. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I could think of a lot of things that could be done that'd be very positive for tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and uh, so I think we have to realize there's going to be a big cost. It will be a system that will have some lack of flexibility, let's just say. It'll be what it is. Um, and it's going to be very much dependent on who's there. And so the risk of having it, I think, is greater than the not having it. And I find it interesting, all these people are saying, we want a home in government. And yet, they're not sure where that home is going to be. What happens if they say it's Department of National Defense? Are you going to be happy with that? I mean, maybe that's good. It'll be good for some groups that deal with disasters, right? But you get what I'm saying? Like, uh, people are just running like lemmings off a cliff. They're not actually thinking through the stuff. But, you know, so what will happen is we'll have a situation. Um, I mean, I love the Australian Charity Commission, and they brought on a head who is a very controversial, far-right sort of guy. And um, and it changes the whole tenor of the thing. And uh, so anyway, I hope we don't have to deal with it. But if there is a home in government, uh, which home will it be? And uh, is it going to be a comfortable home for the charity sector? And I, I certainly hope if it happens that it's successful. But uh, I am worried that it probably will not be successful looking at some of the other countries and how it's worked out. Okay. Before we move off of the We Charity scandal, I think the one thing that struck me and it also concerned me was how the issues around that scandal had perhaps impacted the sector in terms of public trust, but also in organizations' willingness to explore other alternative forms of revenue than the classic sort of grants and donations. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I would say that the, the We Charity scandal, as I said earlier, there's uh, lessons learned. Some of them are the wrong lessons and some, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I think there is going to be a long-term impact of the We Charity scandal, but I think that one of the biggest concerns I have right now, and there's a, a writer by the name of Stephen Iyer who wrote a very good piece um, on um, basically how over the last 20 years, there's been a decline in trust in charities, okay? Now, we know there's been a decline in trust in all institutions, except the decline in charities is worse, okay? Um, and sometimes the charitable sector needs the trust more than, say, a company. You know, I have an Apple iPhone. If Apple's not great, it's going to probably take a lot for me to switch to something else, okay? But, you know, if some charity is, I don't trust them or I have a problem with them, I'm just going to switch to another charity because there's so many charities, right, that you can, you, your choice is just uh, so many, right? So I think it's, it's a problem for the charity sector. And I think we did cause a bit of a 
drop, obviously, but I wish I wish it was all because of we, because then it's solved, right? Uh, you know, we is not really the same issue as it was before. It's not. There's a fundamental problem where you have a lot of charities that are transparent, but you have a lot that are not. Okay, um, you know, if you're trying to check people going on a plane for guns, you don't just check the first fifty people. You check everyone if that's a concern that you have. When it comes to transparency. The fact that half the charities are transparent and half, I'm just saying half, you know, I mean, I'm not thinking uh, that some are very transparent and they try hard to be transparent and others, they don't have a website or they have information that's old or it's very selective. It doesn't answer all the, que like the basic questions that even a donor would have and things like that. So I think that's, if anything, the biggest problem. We have a T3010 that is technically like nine pages long, but for most charities is about three pages long. It gives you almost no information on a charity. The American 990 gives you far more information than the Canadian return. And we have people in Canada saying we want less information on the return. Okay, so um, it's going to be a problem. If people don't trust charities, they're less likely. It's not just a money thing. It's tough for fundraisers to make their jobs harder. But it's not just that. It's charities. You know, you look at COVID. You look at the... Um, people who are not trusting science, who are not trusting hospitals and uh, people like that. Um, this is a problem. So that's a good example right now. Lack of trust in basic science and what charities say about how you should get vaccinated and then you should do this and you should do that is making this, what is a terrible pandemic, far worse than, you know, I think we could have had even less people die, be out of this much quicker, have much less stuff if people would just get on the same you know, uh, approach instead of having it become a partisan political issue and all this other stuff. I look at countries like Portugal, where they had one guy read the effort, you know, some soldier, some submarine captain, and, you know, they ended up with like very quickly 90% of the population vaccinated, you know. And, and so if we can, if we have lack of trust in charities, it's going to make a lot of things charities do a lot harder. And I think that long term, that's my big concern. We help to make it worse for charities, but the charities have, through lack of accountability, transparency, uh, constantly saying we want less regulation, which means for most charities, nothing because they weren't affected by it or it's not a problem. But it means some charities will do egregious stuff because now there's no law that prevents them from doing it. Um, and all it takes is 100 or 200 or 500 charities doing bad things out of the 86,000. So that's not even 1% of charities act badly. It's bad for the charity sector. So that's why I think long term, that's going to be the impact. The media is waking up to that charities are complicated. There's many different types of charities. It's not all wonderful volunteer you know, groups that just pick up litter on the side of the road. It's more complicated than that. And now that the liberals have removed the, the restrictions on political activities, so you still can't do partisan, but you can do unlimited. So you can spend 100% of your money on things like saying we should have more immigration to Canada or we shouldn't have immigration to Canada. And you have groups who are basically now spending all their money on we shouldn't have immigration to Canada. We shouldn't have taxes that, are, you know, and this, that. Is that charitable that we want to have all, like, at least I think they should do some charitable work. And then they can also do some political. I don't have any problem with that. But the liberals have gone to the nth, the other extreme of making it uh, open like that. And uh, that that is a danger for the charity sector, that we're going to be less charity and more hardcore partisans who disguise themselves as being charities um, and they don't directly criticize a candidate, but you can tell quite quickly what they're all about. And um, and I think that's not a good thing for the charity sector. Okay. No, it doesn't sound like it's very good. Um, uh, I, I'd like to switch now to uh, some, uh, some legislation that's been going through the process of uh, potentially becoming law. Can you provide some uh, some background for those who may not be familiar with Bill S216 and explain what it proposes to change. Yeah, I think um, you might have to ask the people who are proposing it what exactly it means, because I actually don't think it's so clear what it means. Okay, that's the first thing. But secondly, it's basically a bill that was passed in the Senate that's in the House. You know, when there was the occupation in Ottawa, it was pretty bad, right? 
funnily enough, the House was discussing this bill, okay? And I thought it was very ironic. You, you would think that there would be other things they were discussing, like getting rid of the protesters, but this is what they were discussing. So it's, it's got a lot of uh, political supporters. I think all three political, big political parties support it. Um, I don't think any of them know what the bill's about, to be frank. They're just supporting it because it doesn't involve a quote-unquote cost immediately to them. And uh, lots of charities are saying we want it. So, okay, let's, let's go with this and let's pass it. But basically how it works is you have a charity sector where you're – it's called qualified donee. It includes charities and some other groups that can issue official donation receipts. And right now, if you want to move money between these qualified donees, you can just cut a check and give money from one to the other. It's you know very seamless. But every one of those groups is vetted, if you will. Um, so it's um, it's like a club, if you will. Then you have about 7 billion entities, human beings around the world, uh, you know, for-profit companies, non-profits, foreign charities, just non-profits around the world. You've got about 7 billion entities that are what are called non-qualified donees. So the question is, what sort of rules should we have with those groups uh, moving money? Sometimes this money gets an 80% tax advantage when it goes in. Okay, so huge tax advantages, uh, which is costing taxpayers money. Now, if we want to move out, say, a billion or 10 billion, what what sort of controls do we need to have over that money? And that's really what it's about. They are saying that they don't like the rules that the courts have upheld about five times, which is called you know direction and control or structured arrangements, where you have to do eight things, basically, to move money from a charity to a non-charity. You're really hiring the non-charity to do some work. I've been working in this area for a long time. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be uh, glitchy or whatever, but most of the time it works. The rules we have, you can pretty much work with any group as long as it's not involved with violence or terrorism. Any group around the world, a Canadian charity can hire them to do a project. And uh, we have about $4 billion going abroad that way every year. And then we don't know because we don't have transparency on it, how much in Canada, but there's probably many billions also in Canada going. Um, I just worked on a $65 million project that was government funded that went to a charity and that charity gave it exclusively to non-qualified donees through direction and control. And so I think these are very doable for groups that want to just spend 10 grand abroad or groups who want to spend tens of millions of dollars abroad. You start changing rules. There's one problem that you have, which is, okay, so you've changed the rule. That doesn't preclude other people from suggesting other changes to the rules. So what I'm worried about actually is some people are going to really wake up to the fact that maybe we don't have enough oversight of money, for example, leaving. I mean, we just realized a couple of weeks ago that we don't have enough oversight over money coming into Canada. I think a few people realized that, right? And Canada is a strong country. It can afford to take care of these problems. Other countries are sometimes not. So when we have Canadians sometimes sending money abroad for things that are highly questionable, the ability of other foreign countries sometimes to deal with it is less. So I think we need to have a real adult discussion about money coming in and money going out to the country uh, of the country. And I'm not one of these guys who says, oh, ban all foreign money. I think that's stupid. I think there's lots of great things money coming into Canada is doing and money going out is doing. But we cannot ignore that sometimes groups are also doing bad things. And how do we have oversight about it? And so this legislation would say, you no longer have to do charitable activities. You just need to have a purpose that's charitable. You can move out money. So I give the example of a foundation. It gives money, let's say, for religion to a group in the Cayman Islands, say a billion dollars. And that group gives it to another group in uh, Turks and Caicos for a billion dollars, uh, you know, moves over. The money spent, you've, you've given money for the purpose, end of story. So now CRA shouldn't look at that billion dollars. Let's not discuss it. It's nothing to do with the Canadian government at this point. And I think 40 to $80 billion is going to leave this country, but not if I thought 40 to 80 billion was going to go to Africa to help poor people, I would be all over it as a wonderful thing. No, it's just going to move. So it's not regulated anymore. We'll have no idea. Some of the money will be well spent. Some of it will be who knows what will happen to it. Because in secrecy, sometimes things do happen. Uh, and I'm thinking, so that's why when we is a $400 million problem, this is a $40 billion problem. I think that, and of course, we'll wake up like Citizens United. There were even progressive people who thought it's good. Like, you know, let's have uh, corporations be treated like uh, individuals and they should have freedom of speech and blah, blah, blah. And then you can have unlimited funding for these corporations to do political speech and all that. Be, some liberals thought it was a good idea. And then we saw what the result was. It was Trump in the White House and all this. I think this is sort of the same thing. We're basically playing with fire here between allowing charities to do unlimited political activities, taking away uh, the the sort of barrier between a charity or, or a qualified donee and the rest of the world. It makes it easier for rich people not to pay taxes because they put money in a charity who then gives the money back to them. Uh, because if we don't have 
tight systems. Um, and one can disagree exactly where the system should be and what the rules are. But if you don't have tight systems, then you're going to have people take advantage of our very generous tax systems in this country. And unfortunately with this, um, by the time we realize that it didn't work or there's a problem, it's a 40 billion, maybe a 60 billion dollar problem that we've created. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit thinking, I don't think it's well thought through. I think the political parties are just saying, yeah, we re-support it because they, they don't really care about the charity sector. And they just, you know, 50 groups, 100 groups, 500 groups say it's a good idea. So they, they run with it. So um, I doubt you're going to have another person who uh, of the people that you're asking to speak on this topic who's going to have the same view as me. So I'll start, you know, just say that it is a minority view that I have. Um, but, you know, I've been working in this area for 25 years of foreign activities. And I would also say that a lot of the proponents, they don't actually even understand the rules. They just completely don't understand it. Um, so they say things like, you're not allowed to make a grant to a non-qualified donee. Well, no, actually, the whole system is set up to allow you to make grants to non-qualified donees. You just have to do these basic measures of control, like some due diligence on the group and have an agreement and have a description of the activity and have some reporting. It's not rocket science. And um, as one lawyer came up to me after I gave a big presentation on this topic, and he, he summarized my presentation in three words. So he's obviously a lot smarter than me because I was talking for three hours. And he basically said... Uh, this is ordinary commercial practice. You know, in other words, if you were in a for-profit business and you wanted to buy a million dollar something, you would do due diligence. You would do this. You would do that. It's ordinary commercial practice. It's what you expect in just a normal situation to do. Um, and um, and so I don't actually think that the rules are so bad. They are. They've been upheld by the courts. You know, like I said, five times. And um, I think in light of the current system we have. And by the way, if you want to avoid direction control, it's so easy. Have a nonprofit organization. It's not a charity. It's not charitable funds, and uh, it doesn't have to have direction and control. And it also doesn't have the public expectation that it's going to be run like a charity. It doesn't have the same high standards. So uh, you know you can you can do that. And in fact, I've got I've worked with some groups where they have a separate entity that can do that if it needs to do it. But like I said, in many cases, groups who want to do real charitable activities in foreign countries, there's absolutely no problem with using the current rules. The biggest problem we have is $4 billion goes abroad. Um, it should be much more than that. Um, and in fact, a lot of the money that goes abroad actually comes from outside the country. It comes into Canada and it goes out. So it's not even Canadians giving the money. And there are, you know, we say Canadians are so generous. Well, when you realize that some Canadians like, uh, you know, people who work here, who say come from the Philippines, they send money back remittances to their families and friends and to organizations and things. That's $15 billion. There's no tax support for that at all. But the charity money is heavily tax supported, and it's only $4 billion going abroad. So I think there's something to be said for we need a lot more international activities, and we need it to be more targeted. Um, there was the, It's interesting, if you read the preface the, uh, to this bill, it talks about how we want to have equality and we want to have uh, all these things. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and I agree that we should be funding smaller organizations more. But there's a very simple thing. Global, global Affairs, if they want, they can say to charities, we are going to take off the money we give to charities. And all that money has to go ultimately to, say, a group in the developing world of the global south that has a budget under $100,000. So in other words, a small group, right? Global Affairs can do that easily. So if we wanted to do it, and by the way, global affairs is spending like a third of the amount of money that we've committed that we would do, which is like 0.7%. So we're a laggard in so many respects, and certainly in this area. But if you have, if you really want to help, you know, BIPOC groups, I can think of a hundred ways that will actually do it. This, I think, is a smokescreen. It's a red herring. They're saying we're doing this because it, it isn't as good for indigenous people. Well, wait a second. I just did a big study a year ago looking at how charities fund indigenous charities? And the answer is they give them almost nothing. 0.45%, even though it's 4.9% of the population. And that's so these rules don't apply to that because those are actually charities, right? So they're not even giving when it's easy, when you can just cut a check for 100,000 or 10,000 or $10 million, you can just cut a check to an indigenous group. They're not doing that. So why would we think that they're going to give it when all of a sudden you have a more complicated system? So I think it's a giant smoke screen. It's, a, it's unfortunate. And um, I know some people are upset that they're saying this is an indigenous issue or this is a, an issue of black, you know, black lives matter. It's not. Um, if you want to fund groups that are doing work uh, that is human rights work or whatever, 
if they're in a charity, you can fund them. And if they're in a non-charity, you can fund them. The difference is in a charity, you make a gift. And in a non-charity, you have to make a grant with these direction and control pieces on them. And by the way, any group that doesn't want to have direction and control, they can make themselves into a charity, right? And then they don't have to have direction and control. But for many groups, you don't want to be a charity. It's better to not be a charity. And then just with the small amount of money you get, say, from a particular charity, you do the direction and control. And that just affects some of your work. It doesn't affect the whole big picture. And so you're better off to maintain your, your nonprofit status. So as you can tell, I'm not a fan of this. I've written about five blogs about it. If people want to go to my Canadian charity law.ca website, and they can read in much more excruciating detail. Um, and I would love for someone to tell me what the reasonable sort of standard is when you're doing foreign activities, because that's really what is what is a reasonable person think. And, you know, we have such a diversity of opinion in Canada, and I'm worried that some reasonable people are not as reasonable as you would like, okay? So is a reasonable person, maybe when this gets to court, maybe a judge who's a little conservative in approach, thinks that you need to do 75 things in order to, uh, you know, make sure the money is properly spent, then we might be in a far worse situation than we are right now, where we have our eight measures of control that need to be in place, and they're very workable and doable and all that. So that's my long-winded answer to your question, okay? <laughs> well, it was a very, uh, a, a very thorough uh, answer. In fact, I, I may not have to ask the next question, but, but I, I so, so when we boil it down, it, it's really about a. You believe that it's being proposed in a fashion that is um, suggesting um, a social justice uh, uh, purpose uh, or, or outcome, and you. And really, it's not that at all, because the system would allow allow you to be able for a, chari a charitable organization to work with a non-charity quite effectively. And the, the question of whether the words of direction and control, um, which some see as creates a sort of a impression of paternalism or sort of neo-colonization, mm -hmm. is is simply there in order to ensure that that organization is doing with the money uh, that it's being given to the charity to, uh, to do is, uh, am I correct in understanding you? Yeah, it's much more concise and eloquent than what I was saying, but absolutely. That's it. Um, when a charity has to have exclusively charitable purposes, whereas a nonprofit, for example, doesn't. And I'm glad nonprofits don't have to have exclusively charitable purposes because you know what? There's a lot of good things going on in the world that aren't charitable. So uh, that's why I said in many cases, it's not a good thing for a nonprofit to be a charity, but they may want money from charities. And, you know, to be brutally honest, I think that the um, foundation sector as a whole, not talking about individual foundations, but foundation sector as a whole, has, under, has been underwhelming in terms of its grant making, uh, the quality of the grant making, and also the amounts given out. I think it's hugely embarrassing if one actually looked at some of the stuff, um, how, you know, they're sort of favorites. They give a lot of money to sometimes underperforming. Look at all the groups that gave money to We Charity, okay? Um, you know, not, not giving me great confidence. Um, and uh, I think that foundations can do great work. I've seen foundations do great work. Um, and there are, you know, like, for example, Indigenous, let's say there's um, 1,000 or maybe 1,500 Indigenous groups that are qualified donees. Many of them have gotten zero money from foundations, okay? Zero, not, not a little bit, none. So I'm just like, I don't even know what to say because um, I think that one of our biggest issues in Canada is the Indigenous issue. Um, I think government has to step up. I think foundations have to step up. I think regular charities have to step up. People have to step up. Everyone has to step up. This is a giant smokescreen. OK, because and, and if even if it kicks in, it's only going to kick in two years afterwards. What are people doing today? You've got foundations sitting like one foundation sitting on 40 billion dollars. How much are they giving to indigenous groups in Canada? You know, and uh, so I think that there's a lot of questions people don't want to ask. They would much prefer to criticize the system and say the system, this is a systemic problem, blah, blah. No, well, no. If you had a foundation with $100 million and you want to give out $10 million and you want to give it all to Indigenous people, you know what? You can. But the total amount of money given by all charities, all foundations to Indigenous people is, is actually very low. It's like, I think it was $50 million or something like that. You've got to understand that Brigham Young University in uh, Utah gets more money from charities in Canada than all Indigenous people in Canada, their organizations get money. Like, I, like I don't know where the thing is going here wrong. Uh, there's a problem. 
The problem isn't the system, it's the people, and it's a harder conversation to have, right? The, the, obviously, there are things that can be improved in the system, including making changes to what is called Cypre, which is if you have money that is restricted, but most foundation money is not restricted. But if you had restricted money and you needed to change it because it's really inefficient, our system doesn't allow it to be easily changed. And so I think that's a provincial jurisdiction issue. So the provinces really need to have better Cypre rules. There's no question about that. But I would say that... Um, Right now, and any foundation that doesn't understand how they can fund indigenous or, or you know, black groups or other groups, uh, you know, give me a call. Um, we have courses on it that just tell you how you can do this stuff. How you, and if you need to change your objects, you just go back to CRA and in three months you can have different objects. So it's a very convenient excuse for, and then of course when it happens, and then there will be more funding eventually. I mean, people will be raising the issue of how much foundations are giving. So they will give more. And then they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's because we changed the law. You know, we couldn't do it before. Now we can do it. I, it just makes no sense to me. But anyway, this is uh, something that's being pushed. We'll see what happens. The last time it died because there was an election. I don't think there's going to be an election this time. Um, but I think my biggest concern is that we don't really know exactly what it does. And once it's in place, some huge abuses could happen. And then other rules will come in to prevent those abuses which could put you in a far worse position because, as I said, I would rather we spend far more money abroad and I want it to be as easy as it can, but easy isn't always the right answer, right? Sometimes it can't be that you have it be too libertarian and anyone can do anything they want when it's big government money involved. And charity money is heavily subsidized by government. So, And if you want to avoid these rules, so easy. Just have a nonprofit or have a for-profit doing something. It doesn't have to uh, comply with these rules. Um, and uh, But as I said, any issue you pick, any issue, you can find charities that you can just give to. So you don't even need to think about the rules for direction and control. So if you want to do international work, if you're a foundation, uh, you know, like in Ukraine right now or something, there are a whole bunch of charities doing international work. You don't have to do it yourself. You can just give the money to those charities. They will take care of the, uh, the, the necessary many requirements that are needed, not just because of direction and control, uh, but for other reasons as well. Okay. So when you raise the issue about foundations, I'm assuming it's not among the questions that I sent you, mm -hmm. but... Uh, I'm assuming that you're in support of increasing the mandatory amounts that are to be dispersed. Is that correct? Yes, I've put a policy paper um, up and that I, a submission I made to the finance department. Uh, for about 10 years, we've been suggesting the 3.5% be increased to 5 to 6%. Okay. Um, but, you know, that was a, a modest proposal, I think, to increase it. And I think modest proposals don't go anywhere in life, okay? So um, now there are people saying it should be increased to 10%. And I'm sort of jumping on that bandwagon because it's clearly people don't want modest proposals. So then let's have a radical proposal, um, you know? And, um, and I'm sad that finance did a consultation on this because they should have acted. They should have acted five years ago. Not, it's not, it's, you've got foundations that have doubled or tripled in size, um, have huge 15% returns, sometimes even more, they're paying no tax on the money. And now we have, like, like I said, about $120 billion sitting between the privates and the publics and giving out some of them. One of the biggest ones or the biggest one gave out 1%, I think, in 2019. 1%. I mean, that's hard to imagine. Anyway, so the moral of the story, I think, is that um, it is only one piece, I get it, of the equation. It only talks about the volume of money leaving. It doesn't talk about other things like, will you give to indigenous groups or other groups? Absolutely. But my view is even if more money came out of the charity sector and it continues to be as poorly designated, so for example, BIPOC groups get almost nothing, okay? Even if that continues, but at a much higher rate, it's actually, I think, better because that'll mean more money comes in the charity sector and then government can redirect their money so that, in fact, they don't have to give to this, this, and this. They can give to the groups that foundations seem to be very uh, un uh, not interested in funding. Let's leave it at that. Okay, very important groups doing great work. Um, you know that foundations are just not we're not prepared to give money to. So that's my take: is that yes, it should be uh, doesn't make sense with these huge returns. If and I know that some foundations don't get huge returns, but on the other hand, um, you know this notion that somehow your grand your great grandfather put in a million dollars and now it's you know a hundred years later it's a hundred million, but you know a million dollars back when if you had spent it on doing stuff would have done a huge amount of stuff and helped a lot of people. So time value of money, you can't really compare, but you get the point. So now you've got a hundred million. You haven't had to pay taxes on any of it and you want to give out only three and a half percent. You know, so I think if it was raised to five or 10%, so you'll give out more. 
And, and it means that if you're not going to contribute anything, yeah, it's possible that it could go down in value, your foundation. But where does it say in the Income Tax Act that everyone who creates a foundation should have it forever? You know, it, it isn't, right? And quite frankly, um, I'm not saying we need to have uh, limited time foundations, you know, like, so say 21 years or something. Uh, no, I'm not saying that, although there are some philanthropists who do that. They put money in and then they spend it down and they, they do it that way. I'm saying I think we should give people choices. But we've seen that some foundations have acted in a way that you could say is irresponsible uh, by basically trying to do the minimum. And, you know, I thought with COVID, that would be a bit of a wake up call. And for some groups, I had clients who doubled, tripled, quadrupled what they were spending. For some, they're spending less because they're saying, well, we actually three, four years ago, we spent more. So technically, we can average it over five years. So we don't need to spend. So we're not going to spend money. It's like, come on, guys. This is not a rain. This is a tsunami times five. And you know, you've told us for 20 years that, oh, we're saving up all this money, so we'll have it if, you know, things are, if it's really needed, and, and then you just sort of run away. So I, I think that that's where you need rules. If everyone was acting responsibly, if everyone was giving out 5 or 7% or something like that, we wouldn't even be discussing this. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. But because there are others that are taking advantage of it or they're just not aware of it or they're playing with the numbers and maybe not calculating them correctly um, and, and getting away with it. And no one ever said that for CRA, this is like a number one issue, right? It's clearly not. Um, so they're, they're getting away with it. And um, I think that... Uh, they, they need to do better in this area, and I think it will be helpful to them uh, if finance increase the, uh, the disbursement quota, because for many groups, it's going to be very simple. If you make it into 7%, they will just give out 7%. I think the conservatives had said 7 or 7.5% 7 is in their election platform. Um, and uh, so that makes sense to me to, to increase it. I, um, I can't understand the, uh, the, the, the people who say, oh, we need to study it for another five years. You know, I just I don't understand that. Okay. Um, I have just, uh, I, I want to just sort of allow you to kind mm -hmm. of be more future oriented in terms of some of your thoughts, because I, I, I think that, um, you've raised so many really fascinating points in our discussion on a whole variety of different issues. I, I want to actually ask you, what is your view of what, what any sort of upcoming legislation legislative changes or issues that are emerging in the nonprofit sector that our audience should have on their radar and be aware of or or be either concerned about or to be uh, you know in support of uh, for the benefit of the nonprofit sector and the and and what they're involved in in terms of um, you know giving back as part of their mission what what changes or things should really be on the minds of leaders and or anybody in the nonprofit sector? Absolutely. Um, I put in a submission, I've been doing it for over 10 years to finance every year where I set out many different things that potentially could be looked at. Uh, one of the things is right now, uh, because I am worried about the whole issue of the extent to which uh, the public trust charities and all this, and, and we know that there are some charities doing things they shouldn't be. And I would like that ideally they, they were removed as quickly as possible as charities, right? Right now, the CRA is not allowed to say anything when a charity um, is doing bad things. And sometimes they will know for 10 or 15 or 20 years before they're revoked that the charity is doing bad things. So I want the CRA to be able to say more than what they say right now, which is nothing. Um, so after the charity is revoked, like I said, it could be 10 to 20 years after the initial problems came to light with CRA, they are allowed to give you the extensive letters. And we put many of them on our website so you can read hundreds of these letters. And they're fascinating because they go into a lot of things that CRA doesn't even have guidance on, you know, because CRA is very... Uh, shall we say, cautious when it comes to issuing guidance. Um, but you, sometimes it's good to know what CRA thinks. So I want them to have greater ability to be able to, to say something about it. The other thing is that right now, the charity sector, I said, you know, these very limited T3010s, which have very little information in them, which is unfortunate, because then some foundations ask for a lot of information that they wouldn't ask for if it was all on your T3010 and easily accessible, right? So you end up with a charity having to answer a question 150 times during the year, whereas if they just asked it once on the T3010, it's there and it will mean less people will be thinking about it, okay? Um, but so charities at least have some 
transparency. Nonprofits have close to zero transparency. And there's 80 to 100,000 nonprofits. Some of them could be hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. We just simply don't know. We know nothing really about the nonprofit sector. So there's a form file that's called the T1044, and it's about two pages long. So it has very little information, but it has, you know, like total revenues and things like that. And uh, it's filed by about, say, let's say 30,000 nonprofit organizations every year. So the bigger ones. And those groups basically, um, they file it and CRA puts it in a database. But because of Section 241 of the Income Tax Act, the confidentiality provisions, it's not, no one can see it. Uh, members of parliament can't see it. Senators can't see it. No one can see it except really the people at CRA. Okay. So I was saying just like the charity stuff should be you know, public, and it is, this should be public as well. And then we would have some better idea of what's going on in the nonprofit sector. I, I don't want to make too much out of it, but um, there's a group called FATF, a Financial Action Task Force, which is the international umbrella of about many countries, uh, anti-terrorism, money laundering type stuff. It's a very powerful organization. Um, FATF can crush a country. If FATF has concerns with a country, it can basically blacklist the country um, we saw what happened with Israel when this happened. They completely changed their banking system very quickly because it can crush your country because you'll have basically sanctions against you where other countries will not be able to deal with you. It's very important. FATF has expressed a significant concern about Canada's nonprofit sector and the lack of oversight relating to terrorism and money laundering and things like that. And I think they're completely right. It's a, it's a black hole, basically. So this is not a solution. This is the tiniest possible thing. But even that, there are all sorts of forces who don't want to have it happen. They don't want the world to know that their group has a hundred thousand or a hundred million dollar budget. So those are some examples on the transparency side. I think there's a lot of things that can be done that can be improved. Some it's at the federal level, some provincial, some municipal. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of things that can be done. I think that part of the problem is that CRA is pretty good at dealing with some bad charities, but very bad charities. Charities that are doing really, really bad things, it really isn't CRA's ballywhack. And that's where I think the police need to be more involved. Like when you're talking massive fraud or you're talking uh, abuse of children and stuff like that. And so I think that there needs to be a specialist unit that's set up basically within an agency like the RCMP or some other entity to basically focus on uh, these type of issues. Because unfortunately, I mean, who ran residential schools? I mean, it wasn't the U.S. government who was running our residential schools. It was... Canadian charities and other institutions were running these uh, residential schools. So I, I think we need to realize that because charities are, quote unquote, on the side of angels, it doesn't mean they're all angels. OK, and um, and I'm not talking about most charities. I'm talking about a few. But those few, they're not bad apples in a, in a barrel. This is toxic stuff that's going on that needs to be uh, sort of dealt with. And then, you know, the disbursement quota, you know, that's an embarrassment that we're even talking about it because groups should just be wanting to give out. And, and by the way, I want to be very clear, and I've done uh, for about five, six years now publications on it. There are charities giving, uh, foundations giving out 20% a year, 50% a year. Some groups give out everything every year. They take in 10 million and they give out 10 million. So this, I don't want everyone to think that all foundations act like this and they're trying to give out one or 2%. It's actually a very small number, but some of them are very large. So it adds up to a lot of money that isn't getting to charities that really should be. Okay. So I think that's another thing. But there's lots of areas that could be improved. One of the areas is there are some funds that are held by some charities that have restrictions on them that are just, it, they either can't spend it or whatever. And it's more cumbersome than it should be to get those monies reallocated to something else that's charitable. So the, if, and that's provincial, if provinces could have a better what's called Cypre system, I think that would be really good for many charities to be able to uh, take money that's just sitting around can't be used anyway um you know uh, the ontario nonprofit network uh, sometimes puts out some uh, some really good ideas in terms of how provincial governments can do a better job for example making property available to charities first before they auction it off or you know just all sorts of things that can be done we could do better data collection in the charity sector but i think that the basis should start with the t3010 because it's got some information and it goes back 25 years so basically i think that's going to be the the main thing that would be um helpful is to to collect more data so we can understand our sector better you know when you look at some other sectors like farmers you know they might get paid per chicken or whatever they get paid so they keep track of every chicken and they report you know weekly or monthly and so we can now tell if there's a decline in chicken production or something, we, we don't need monthly, you know, we don't need like that, but we do need more than what we have right now, which is when someone says, Mark, how bad is COVID? I say to them, I will tell you in two years time. Okay. Because 
by then, the last T3010 will be, and by the way, um, I've done the analysis for 95% of charities and we'll, we'll continue on. And COVID was you know, bad in some respects with charities because they had to deal with, you know, hospitals dealing with COVID and, and frontline workers and like losing volunteers and all this. But financially, it wasn't so bad for charities. In fact, there was no big drop off uh, in terms of donations. There wasn't a big drop off in terms of revenue and things like that. So I think that that was another thing where there were people saying, you know, the sky is falling and the sky didn't fall on the charity sector. I'm not saying the sky can't fall. But, you know, you get into this thing where if every time you're saying the sky is falling, people don't start to trust you and, and believe what you're saying. My biggest concern actually is if government funding is reduced for the charity sector. And I could see that happening because we have governments that are now under a lot of strain fiscally. And I'm, so it could be an NDP government. But, you know, if you've got a huge deficit, you've got to deal with it, right? So if there's a 10% decline in government money to the sector, we need to double fundraising to make up a 10% decline. So we need 100% more, which is not realistic, right? So the fact of the matter is that's my biggest worry for the future. So any efforts that can be made to have governments continue funding, to do it better, to do it less bureaucratically, to do it more, um, you know, in, in an equality way. So, you know, right now, some groups, it's like they feel like they have an entitlement. We've gotten government money for 40 years, and, and it's probably true, and they will get it next year and every other year. You know, like, how do we make it more accessible, easier for groups to get it? I think that would be like a huge thing, uh, you know, call it red tape production or something, but it's it's basically uh, vitally important because it's, it's over 60% of the revenue of the charity sector. Um, but there's lots of little things that one can do, but I would say that most proposals, to be frank, that are put forward even by some of the umbrella organizations are not that good. Um, they may sound good at the first blush. Oh, you know, sounds good. But when you actually start looking at it, start thinking about it, start thinking about, okay, what's going to happen in terms of the impact? What, what, you know, you start to realize, wait, this isn't such a good idea. Um, so, and we, we tend to like the Senate recently had a report where they had, uh, I think it was over 40 recommendations and all that. Some of them are very good recommendations. Some of them are terrible recommendations, but they're all in there. Um, the government has done, well, I would say nothing with those recommendations, they responded and they, the only thing they really committed to was one thing. We will, you know, do a consultation on the, the DQ. So basically they said, okay, Senate, you've looked at this thing for two or three years. Uh, we're going to do nothing. Um, you know, that in any other sector, this would be completely an unacceptable response. It would be like the, the top news on CTV and CBC. I don't even think anyone paid attention that they basically said we're going to do nothing for the Senate. And by the way, most of the many of the Senate recommendations were not good recommendations. So I'm, I'm not criticizing them in the sense of not necessarily just implementing all these recommendations, but uh, just saying that uh, that shows you how seriously the, the charity sector is uh, taken practically, that they can just basically scoff at these 40 things, all of them, and just say we're not going to do anything. So. So yeah, lots of ideas of to how to make the charity sector better. Um, there's also things, I mean, sometimes it's just doing the right thing. You know, like, for example, we have minimum standards for employees, okay? You know, minimum standards and things like that. So complying with those minimum standards would be very helpful because I, I think there's two and a half million people working in the charity sector and we always focus on a few that get paid too much money, quote unquote. But there's probably lots of people at the bottom who are being taken advantage that uh, they're not getting paid the right amount of money and things like that and uh, paying a livable wage. And I get it. Charities are always trying to balance things and you want to help the beneficiaries. But, you know, they some charities don't seem to have a problem paying the senior echelon quite well. But when it comes to somehow it's too much of a it's, it's not good for the beneficiaries if you're paying the. The, the lowest echelon of charity employees. So if we could just treat charity employees better, for example, that would mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of people would be lifted up in a positive way. So, I mean, that's, it's not really a, a legal change so much as it is a, um, a change in sort of attitude and things. And we, there's so much education that can be done for charities uh, because you also have boards that are constantly changing and things. So you can't like do a program once and you've solved the problem and now everyone knows it, right? Um, and the charity sector, I know the ideal is everything should be simple, but when you have 252 different types of entities, that's how CRA divides up the charity sector, right? So you've got hospitals, you've got uh, daycares, you've got, uh, you know, all these different types of entities. And to be frank, they have very different requirements and needs, right? And different funding models and all this. So yeah, it's not going to be covered in a one hour course. Okay. And so you need to have lots of capacity building and the government spends on all different levels, almost nothing on it. And I just find it amazing. They're prepared to spend say 160 or $170 billion funding charities, 
but they're not spending even a few million dollars on helping with capacity building. So I just, I find it very uh, interesting. So um, if you want better charities in the end, you have to invest in it. It gets back to that argument about the, the you know, admin and, and spending money on some things. If you want charities to have security, they need up-to-date computers. They need a good antivirus, anti-malware stuff. Um, yeah, it's cheaper to have a computer without that stuff, but it's not a smart idea, especially if the charity has important information on it, right? Uh, so those are you know, lots of challenges, but luckily there are some people pushing for, uh, you know, having a better sector. And, um, I, you know, with so many changes as a result of COVID, um, it did result in a lot of people just rethinking things, which is good, because sometimes you just do the same thing for 30 years and you don't think about it. So I'm optimistic. Hopefully there will be a better time coming. And, um, and uh, yeah, and so hopefully that'll happen one day. Well, Mark, I can I can tell that you're rather passionate about uh, trying to make the system better for the nonprofit sector. And, and uh, you know, it's been really fascinating talking to you, your insights into the legal issues, but also the political issues and, and, and some of the other problems related to Canadian charities and nonprofits and, and the challenges that they face has been really, really enlightening and I think will be extremely helpful for the sector um, as organizations and leaders navigate um, these kinds of changes and challenges. So I, I really appreciate your time and I, I want to thank you for joining us. It was a real pleasure um, being able to talk to you. Mary, thank you very much for pulling this all together. I know it's a lot of work, so thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.